Hey everyone, welcome to Neil Talks. My name's Neil and it's time to talk QI. This week's viewer recommendation takes us to a recent season, Series R, and uh, another Giles Brandreth episode. So I'm buckling in for some long, really charming stories, probably some crazy coincidences because he's led such a varied and storied life. Yeah, Giles is really growing on me. He's got this very affable charm to him that that's really endearing. And yeah, I don't know who the other guests are, but I can imagine that this is just going to be a chicken soup for the soul kind of episode. It's just going to be heartwarming and, uh, and funny. So no expectations beyond that. Might as well jump right into it. This is episode seven from series R, and it's called Revolutions. Welcome to a truly a revolutionary episode. Rising up in revolt this week, we have four recalcitrant renegades, the radicals, Susan Kalman. Oh, cool. <laughs> Haven't seen Susan in a while. Jessica Fosterkew. <laughs> she looks like the actress that played Darlene on Roseanne, but I know it's not her. And it's Giles. And he's an absolute riot. It's Alan Davis. <laughs> That's a very sweet intro. Does he know the sex? He must know the sex. I he's recognize probably... this. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Once in the 1980s, oh I God. met. Here comes. I hung it with Johnny Rotten. It's true. I yeah. met Johnny Rotten. Did you? I went up to him and I said, oh, Mr. Rotten, I'm so delighted to meet you. And he said to me, fuck off. <laughs> That's it. I love that she's got her feet up. There's literally nothing I could say to you. You wouldn't have an anecdote. <laughs> Revolutions. Stop me when you know what these names are for, okay? Patriotic Shortener. Silence Mills, um, the nickname I gave to my worst ever Edinburgh show. Uh, <laughs> we punks will remember a band called Silence Mill. Okay. Charlie Seesaw, that could be a racehorse. Guillotine, yeah. guillotine, guillotine. Oh, guillotine. Okay. I don't want to not get the point on a matter of admin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All nicknames for the guillotine used in the French Revolution. Gotcha. Uh, yes, you met the man who invented <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon and I go way back. He told me to fuck off. <laughs> I do have a personal interest in the subject as it happened. Oh, why is that? Right, but before darling? I get to that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you what little I know about the guillotine. Do we get bonus points for this information or am I just wasting time? Yes. My recollection yes. is. Yes. My but we're going back a bit. It's I, the French I, Revolution. It's the French Revolution. <laughs> but I know it went on for years and years and years because in 1977, I went to Paris for the last use of the guillotine. I was a campaigner against capital punishment. Right. This was still going on. I know. What well, did you have t-shirts that said quit while you're ahead? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just say goodnight, Sandy. Obviously, I was in Paris trying to ferment in my pre-punk period yes. the revolution in France at the time. <laughs> When I was at university, I was simply trying to get laid. I'll be very honest. <laughs> I wore lots of corduroy and tried to look intelligent. But, uh, sadly, the ruse did not work. <laughs> corduroy, that'll do it for you. Uh, there is a rumour that he was killed by his own apparatus. It is not true. In fact, he died from an infection. That's What's a carbuncle? It's not pleasant. Don't no. get one. Well, a nice carbuncle at the end of the night, though. That can walk. <laughs> <up. laughs> <laughs> we well, can have a carbuncle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, here you're trying to get laid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there was a man by the name of Giles Henri Sanson. He was a celebrity because he was France's executioner, and his uniform uh, became a very fashionable look for men. What do you think women might have worn to celebrate? Corduroy. <laughs> <laughs> women wore guillotine-shaped earrings. Oh, and what's oh. the, um, that's the king and queen's head below. Oh. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, no. That's so morbid. I think I might quite like what? them. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't feature any of this in Carry On Up the French Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, uh, oh, I want to watch that again now. Oh. You never see them anymore. They used to be on all the time. No, they're on ITV too. If you if you watch television oh, in the afternoon, if you've got no job, self-employed, sorry, if you're self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> I do the voiceover for one of the commercials. I'm the voice now of the Tenor Flex Plus Super Soft Incontinence Pad. <laughs> <laughs> The joy is you can watch all the Carry On films right through the afternoon and evening without needing to leave the sofa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he passed the job to his second son, who was called Henri Clément. He had serious gambling debts and he eventually pawned off the guillotine to pay off his debts. And he turned up at the next execution with an axe. So they fired him and uh, the Ministry of Justice had to buy the guillotine pack from... <laughs> Uh, who is the woman associated with the French Revolution? Uh, Madame Tussaud, because she took facial masks, didn't she? Death masks yeah. of the people. I used to work in Madame Tussauds. Oh, this is marvellous. Really? Somebody who can out-anecdote Giles, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> I worked as a zombie. Because my acting career got off to a really quick start. <laughs> and um, be jumping out at people in this scary maze. But you learnt to wax, which was to stand completely still and then just move a bit and people would cack themselves. <laughs> and then um, I got told after my second stint there that I was the scariest woman they'd ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> my forebear, mm. Jeremiah Brandreth, was a revolutionary and the last person to be beheaded in this country for treason. Wow. He began as a Luddite. He realised that the Industrial Revolution was going to make people lose their jobs. He was known as the Nottingham Captain and uh, was arrested, put on trial, and was not just hanged, but he was then beheaded yes. because he was a traitor. Now, we were trying to see the uh, family likeness in this, so uh, we've done a little bit of photoshopping just to see how that would <laughs> we've look. We've bearded. So there you are. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you were ever beheaded, uh, just as they lifted the head up, you'd be going, I've got one more story. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me. But how can you cause a riot with a clown hat, some vodka, and a lump of cheese. Is it a circus riot? Uh, well, there are three separate riots, in fact. Oh, okay. uh, the one with the clown hat, so it was 1850s. You're talking it must about... be a Russian circus. Uh, no, it's Toronto. Oh, really? <laughs> the riot began after a fireman, a uh, drunk fireman, knocked off a clown's hat in one of the city's brothels. And when he refused to pick it up... Uh, a couple of trapeze artists swung in. <laughs> it started a complete riot, and it went on for days. Clowns fighting firemen. <laughs> Firemen have got hoses, it, and the clowns have just got a bucket of... <laughs> 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 yeah, but they kept getting in the car, and there was loads of them. Wow. I know, it's fantastic. So what about the cheese? Oh, it's not the, the same event? No, they're no. different. This is going to be it, Dutch. They're doing the cheese rolling. Does that ever get out of hand? Well, it did. The price of cheese? Well, if you think about the French Revolution, that was instigated by the women in the market over the price of bread. Yeah. Um, this is the Great Nottingham Cheese Riot. Uh, they seized the cheese, and you're quite right, Giles. They seized the, the cheese. Seized the cheese. Seized the cheese. That's what every good riot needs is a great slogan. He seized the cheese. The mayor tried to quell the violence and was knocked out by a particularly large cheese. <laughs> Uh, the vodka, so this started really as a vodka boycott. The Russians did a tax hike vodka. and it tripled the price. <laughs> so it went up to 10 rubles a bucket, is how they used to buy it. <laughs> by the bucket. The of course they do. Clark made 25 rubles a year. Oh, jeez. And so temperance societies started all over the country. And this was a nightmare for the government because they needed the money from the tax. Vodka started being given away free to try and persuade people to be a little bit more alcoholic. Rebels uh, who, who didn't want the vodka tax were made to drink vodka forcibly with a funnel was put down their throat. I mean, it was extraordinary. Eventually, the revolt was crushed and the government banned temperance societies. It was forbidden to want to be sober. Wow. <laughs> As a teenager, I once snorted vodka. How does one do that? With a straw. Up your, up your nose. nose. Up your nose. And then you cry it out of your eyes. I grew up in the West Country, so we didn't have much to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you have to do if someone read you the Riot Act? 
technically you had an hour to disperse right. once oh. it had been read out. So it was introduced okay. in 1715. To clear crowds. To clear the crowds out. A policeman was entitled to read them the riot act, and after that they had a full hour. You've got an hour now to stop rioting, which I quite like. It's very British, mm. isn't it? I'm giving yeah. you notice. Mm. In fact, uh, the last attempted reading of the riot act was in, have a guess, anybody? Which city in this country? Manchester. Glasgow. 1919, but the policeman couldn't get through it before somebody took the page from his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Steal the riot act Boy. from the cop. <laughs> <laughs> was that a Scottish accent you just did? <laughs> no, it was, yeah. it was an Irishman visiting. To be fair, <laughs> and I don't think that's particularly classic. If, if, I may, if I may, Alan. Big... <laughs> and I knew you were going to say Glasgow because you looked at me with that look you look at Sandra. Just because it was Glasgow does not mean that they, they were violent. No, I didn't say paper. that. I they, never they said that. They simply politely went, I'll take that from you, young yes. sir. Yes. I imagine. <laughs> My great grandfather Excuse left Glasgow in 1920, yeah. just I after this. That? I wonder if he was really like involved. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want there to be any suggestion no, that the Glasgow nobody victims was were aggressive. Um, but <laughs> <it's just> Excuse <laughs> me! <laughs> um, it's quite challenging for middle class people to start riots, as I've discovered. You've got to wait in for your white company order. I mean, oh, we're, we're go <laughs> the thing that always throws me is the British definition of middle class versus the North American definition. Two very different things. And apparently, knocking hats off goes back hundreds of years as the way riots are started, as in the case with your clown. I think, to be fair, if I had gone to the effort of wearing one of my hats... <laughs> is it made of corduroy? <laughs> <laughs> The list of impediments to you getting shagged goes on. And you're walking down the street, you're thinking, people are laughing at me, but I don't care. In myself, I have the confidence. I've worked on myself a lot. This is how I feel. I feel confident. I'm a powerful woman. I'm clear balding. People looking for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's that and cowboy somebody... hat moving by itself? <laughs> <laughs> there must be a dog under there, a tiny dog. <laughs> <laughs> that dog's never going to get shagged wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't your house have revolving doors? My house does have revolving doors. <laughs> <laughs> it, it always has. It's a family house. It's a tradition. One of my forebears invented the revolving door. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. Know who invented the, the revolving the door? The elves. Yes. Just do a ton Van of Brandreth research. It's not so much a family tree as a family fucking forest. <laughs> <laughs> So at home, the point is, yes. we, we love it. It's been so useful recently. You know, we only want to self-isolate. Yeah. We can have three of the family. <laughs> uh, <actually laughs> it's the reason we don't have them on our homes because of too many terrible pet deaths. No, it's just the house isn't big enough and we don't oh. get that many visitors. Oh. Oh. When I'm in London where there's more revolving doors available, I'll just go in a building and then come back out and pretend to be Wonder Woman. I'll just do it. <laughs> It's a suitcase that's bigger than me, and it makes revolving doors Full quite hats. difficult. Full of hats. But you just have to do it because then people look at you like you can't do a door. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you get out of the suitcase? Yeah. I'll <laughs> <laughs> get two little leg holes cut. <laughs> <laughs> How's that suitcase moving along the road? You can <laughs> enter and exit at exactly the same time, so you can get more people in and out of the building. How can you get more people in a revolving door than just if you had one big door? A very large door that's basically called an open space. <laughs> <laughs> what you've got there is a yeah. Susan's having a hard time today. How can this stop your cherries from popping? <laughs> um, there we go. Okay, it's a little remote control helicopter. We shouldn't be this oh, that's excited. Yeah, well, oh, the cherries pop. Oh. Uh, well, we they do. Why fine. might they? Is it something to do with the harvesting? Infestation. Yes. Like we're, they absorb it's... water incredibly quickly, so just one heavy bout of rainfall can cause them to split, and that renders the entire crop absolutely uh, worthless. One of the ways to do it is to blow dry the fruit with a helicopter. Okay. Um, also hired in sporting events, so they're used to dry cricket pitches, sometimes golf Helicopters. courses. Yeah. Really? Anybody want to see a helicopter carrying a rhino? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Love that. Right? Of course. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, <laughs> it's kind of upside down. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so tranquilized. It's, it's getting relocated. Yep. This is in, uh, they're fully sedated. It does them no harm. Apparently, the hardest part is putting them back down gently. 
Yeah, oh. making sure that well, especially if he's landing horn first. Do you know how old the word chopper is for a helicopter? For those guys. <laughs> Settle in. Was it your uncle Sergeant Chopper? <laughs> Chopper Brandreth, as he was known. Chopper Brandreth. Did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> the helicopters in the Korean War made this noise, like chop, 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 chop. Oh, so 50s, yes. 1951. So that's where it dates from. Whereas have. popping your cherry goes back to 1605. <laughs> I think it's been going on for longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> can you draw a perfect circle? So let's have a go. Uh, no. Should have oh. Nobody him. can. There's Nothing can draw a perfect circle. I think the trick is going to be the same as when you tell someone you're pregnant really and just do it really fast. Yeah. <laughs> really? Not bad, not bad at all. It's going to turn out that I'm a serial killer or no. something. No. <laughs> They're not bad at all. <laughs> One of Giles's ancestors. <laughs> Dear old pumpkin brand. <laughs> <laughs> the world champion circle drawer. His name is Alex Overwike. You should pivot around a part of your body. I would say that's cheating. If you say, if you say I, to no, me... No, but you're not using any mechanical device. You're simply using your body. I you, still... you look like you're having an arm wrestle with your imaginary friend. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. They did a video of him drawing a circle and it sort of went viral. I think I've seen this clip. I've seen the, the, the viral clip of him. Isambard Kingdom Brunel was rather famous for his ability mm. to draw perfect circles. Uh, although I have to say, some of the ones in his notebooks are singularly bad. Why might they be so wobbly, do you think? Was he on a piece of machinery? On a train at the time. Yeah. He was on his locomotive. He was on a train, absolutely. Ah. He was testing the smoothness of rival railway lines. Oh, wow. Now, for a question about roulette. I can tell you that these are all black. These are the ones, the last ones that have come up, the last five. What would you bet on now? Would you bet on black or red? I think it doesn't matter. That is correct. Yeah. What's gone before bears this is completely no relationship irrelevant. to it the probability of what's going to happen next. It's 50 50. It's, it's, red or, it's going to be red or, or black. Actually, on roulette, it's not 50 50. It's 49 49 too. <laughs> About. Because there's also the greens. Wear my lucky pants. Which is why the house always wins. Yes. Because I enjoy QI yes. and I want to do well to impress you, yes. I'm wearing my lucky pants. Right. If what you're saying is correct, I may as well not bother wearing these pants that I've had for 20 Except years. <laughs> that's correct. Although it's not quite a 50-50 bet because there is also a zero and that is how they actually make their money in the casinos. I'll tell you why I'm not allowed in casinos. <laughs> oh, you can't see it over the table. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so bizarre that Sandy's making hype jokes. Briefly believed that when Elvis died, his soul entered my body, but that's a different, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different part of my life. Anyway, it was my first time in a, cas a casino, like a proper casino. I had a credit card for the first time, and I ran up ten thousand no. pounds in uh, six hours. You lost ten thousand pounds. Yeah, one night. Yeah. She, yeah, I had the complete reverse experience. Ten pounds on number three, and it came up. So that's 35 times the, the, the win, right? So I didn't know you were supposed to take the money off the table, so I just left the money there. And they spun the wheel, and it came up again. Oh. <gasps> and the croupier said, Madam, you have no idea what you're doing. Take your money and go home. So I did. Oh, so you walked away with, like... How much money did you win? It's an enormous amount of money. I took a helicopter back to the airport. <laughs> it's like 10 grand. Food. She won everything Susan lost. My wife and I went for a wedding anniversary to Barbados. We were on the beach, and this little old wizened lady came teetering along the beach towards us, and it wasn't until she got to about here that we realised it was actually Mick Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out he was a really enthusiastic viewer of Countdown, so he knew who I was, and we went to a casino with Mick Jagger, and he very sweetly gave us the chips, which was fantastic. That's amazing. Lovely. Yeah. Right. Wow. What's so, so un-British about a roundabout? Do you you will French? not be surprised to know that is a family story. <laughs> 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 One of my forebears was married to the Emperor Napoleon III of France. What? Okay? He decided that Paris needed to be redesigned and chose a man called Haussmann to do it. And that is why Paris looks like Southport. Yes. 
But the actual roundabout was the invention of a French town oh. planner, Eugénie Inard. Earlier, before the start of the show, Charles yeah. told me that my, um, my key card for my dressing room would also work on the tube. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Initially, you were allowed to go in any direction. Uh, around. No, see, I like that. Which was, uh, <laughs> well, that sounds chaotic. And so in 1907, British researchers were sent to observe it, and mm -hmm. they copied it, and they installed the very first... Yes, darling? I, you're going to find this almost impossible to believe. <laughs> <laughs> My father... Yes. ...was the legal advisor to the Automobile Association and a friend of Ernest Marple's, who was the transport minister. My father went with Ernest Marple's to help him open Britain's first roundabout, roundabout. in Letchworth, Newtown. You are absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Can you see the red car? This is my dad. <laughs> 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 uh, what can you put on your fish and chips in a chippy? Salt and vinegar. Why can't you? Salt, yes, but not vinegar. Uh, because ah. it's really not vinegar. vinegar. It's, it's all labelled non-brewed condiment. Not only can it not be labelled as vinegar, you can't even put it in a receptacle that would usually hold vinegar. So could you start... What Tell that to her on the right. <laughs> <You'll have me>. <laughs> 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 not vinegar. No, it's something, it's a combination of water and ethanoic acid and flavourings. It's cheaper, it takes less time to make, you can buy it in concentrated form. And it's it lovely. You have um, salt and sauce, don't you? Yeah. No, no, what no. What is the sauce in no. the sauce? No, in Edinburgh they have salt and sauce, in Glasgow we have salt and vinegar because we're classy. But you don't. <laughs> it is, in fact, non brewed condiment, but weirdly people don't order it like that. <laughs> <laughs> weirdly. I'm absolutely shell shocked by this new sound. <laughs> You've yeah. ever told me on QI. This I think is the this, one that's upset this, you. This is the one that's really rocked my world. <laughs> How many trees are there on the planet compared to 40 years ago? Many more. Giles. Many more. Because they do them in China, don't they, Giles? Trees now cover 7% more of the Earth's surface than they did in 1982. Yeah, but 82 is probably the absolute low point. But it's not a good thing. Uh, because it's China, well, they've doubled their tree coverage. However, it's forestation for agricultural purposes. Yeah. So you don't get um, an ecosystem, you, you don't, don't get, get wildlife and insects. And... Yeah. Who invented the battle technique of Blitzkrieg? Yes. yes. The Canadians. Someone Giles is related to. No. <laughs> <laughs> Blitzkrieg Brandreth. <laughs> Germans. Uh, no. The French. Uh, so, uh, Russians. Uh, British. It was, British. It was us. In fact, Hitler called it... A completely idiotic word, ein ganz blutzninger Wort. Mm. It's not often I quote Hitler. <laughs> 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 the success of the Blitzkrieg uh, completely uh, surprised them. They thought it was rather a miracle. But it wasn't any uh, new innovation. Lots, things of lots of tanks and lots of peaceful, undefended villages. That's it. But the British and American press, they decided the advance by the Germans, which surprised everybody, including the Germans, it had to be a revolutionary new kind of warfare. So they claimed the Blitzkrieg. What goes around comes around, and so we're back to revolutions. In which month do Russians celebrate this revolution? Yes. Well, October. October. <laughs> <laughs> It'll celebrate in October. But it's celebrated oh. in November. Why might that be? Because it's my birthday and everyone has a party on my birthday. <laughs> oh, did they shift the calendar? They did shift the calendar. Oh, That's yeah. exactly it. The Bolsheviks under Lenin revolted on October the 24th and 25th, but it was, according to the rest of Europe, November the 6th and... <gasps> this is my birthday, November the 6th! Lenin would have been so pleased. Is that... Is that... <laughs> <laughs> in last place, with minus 14, it's Alan. Oh. It's a respectable last. Three points, Susan. Oh, yay! Yeah. Positive score. With four points, Jessica. Yeah. And with uh, five points in first place because he is related to the man who invented first place. <laughs> <laughs> Giles! <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> I swear, the more you watch of Giles, the crazier it gets because. I mean, A, his his knowledge of his own family tree is ridiculous. I couldn't tell you anything about any of my ancestors beyond my great-grandparents. And 
the woman who helped Bonnie Prince Charlie escape from somewhere. Flora McDonald. She's an ancestor. But other than that, I couldn't tell you anything. But, but Giles has this encyclopedic knowledge of his entire family tree and not just who like his relation to all of these people but like how many children they had and how many were women and men and like the the dates and the 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 history all their personal stories it's 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 mind-blowing but it's so freaking entertaining and obviously this isn't coincidence these things come up obviously the elves have basically been given the brandreth family forest and they they do some research, they pluck some stories, and they, they write an episode around it. As one should, because Giles becomes the center of attention for any episode that he appears on. Not because he hogs the spotlight, but, but partly because he's become sort of this running joke. Sandy just sort of puts her feet up and lets him talk about it. Like, it, we didn't even get out of the the testing the buzzers this this episode before Giles is talking about how he hung out with Johnny Rotten in 1980. This is just the life this man has led and I, I think it's hilarious and brilliant and 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 it feels like an infinite resource to mine. It feels like this show could run through the alphabet another cycle and Giles could appear every year and you would not run out of a forebear of mine actually did this or that or the other thing or I live in this person's house now or whatever you know give him long enough and he'll be telling stories about what his children are up to or something I don't know uh, or his grandkids or my, my point being He's just such an amazing rack on tour. He's got such he's such a great storyteller. He and and he tells a story well. I, I wonder with characters like him, like is every one of his anecdotes an anecdote he's already told dozens of times and and therefore he's sort of found the best way to tell that particular story, to to hit the punchline, to to shock and surprise and and to joke and all the rest of it or is this the first time he's mentioned that but I don't think it is I feel like Giles is always telling stories and the vast majority of the time he's telling stories about his experiences and his family's history that feels like his his wheelhouse and he is a master of it and my hat's off to him maybe it's a giant cowboy hat that would make one invisible to a passerby Susan Coleman she was in a weird state this episode she just felt like she was particularly a target of Alan. But I, I, I think this may be the first time I've ever seen Sandy mock somebody else for how short they are. Because Sandy's usually the butt of those jokes. But now I need to see Sandy and Susan next to one another to gauge their relative lack of height. Nevertheless, <laughs> great episode. Thank you guys so much for recommending it. And uh, if there's any other episodes that you want to see that I haven't yet tackled, by all means, let me know in the comments. I, I have my list. I'm working through it. I have months scheduled out ahead already. I will get to them all eventually, and uh, I'm having a blast doing it. So until the next one, everybody, take care, stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Cheers.